performing spine surgery live, broadcasting it to you live over the internet. And we're broadcasting over Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope. The reason we broadcast live is so that you can watch a real live spine surgery and see what it's about without editing it or cutting any of the reality out of it. If we have problems, you'll see how we deal with them. We're trying to create a video archive of real spine surgery and the challenges that sometime occur in the operating room and how we deal with them. It doesn't do any good to show you a surgery that's been edited out, all the challenging parts for educational purposes because then you're not gonna learn how to deal with the challenging parts of the surgery. Now during this broadcast, you're welcome to ans answer, ask questions and we'll do our best to answer them, okay? We're doing a surgery called a posterior cervical decompression infusion. That's the abbreviated version of it. Basically, this patient has pressure on their spinal cord and nerve roots at multiple levels in their cervical spine, which is the neck. And they're developing something called myelopathy, which is dysfunction of the spinal cord. Why am I, give me a second here. This right over, well, this whole thing should be further north, I think. I know you got it at the right spot there, Luis. Yes, sir. But for some reason, it's not far enough north. I think that's good. Let me get up there. All right. So this patient has multiple levels of narrowing and pinching of the spinal cord and nerve roots. And so we're going to go in there today and unpinch the nerves and spinal cord. That's our primary goal. Um, the problem is if we do this surgery like we're about to, it's going to destabilize the spine and over time sh her head will sag down onto her chest. So her chin will be resting on her chest and she won't be able to pu pull her head up. So we want to prevent that development of that chin on chest deformity so we're going to be doing an instrument infusion with bone graft and we'll go through everything as we do it. At the end we'll put a drain in and uh, some antibiotic powder. We have a guest today, Dr. Atwater, who will be observing. Are we ready? We are ready. We've already done our timeouts, and we're going to get started. Sir, are you ready, Dr. Yeah. Fu? Yeah. Okay. We're going to make our skin incision. This is the skull of the patient. We want to be just below. Now, we're not using x-ray during the surgery. Some surgeons use x-ray, some don't. The x-ray would be used for localization as well as placement of implants. The implants we're going to put in today are cervical lateral mass screws, rods, hold on. And um, we also are going to localize, but the way I localize for these surgeries is with, um, I use the anatomy, the patient's anatomy. So we're going to find the spinous process of C2 at, up top, and we're going to find the transverse process of T1. How's the blood pressure? Can we, if we can get it down below 100, that would be perfect. So I can tell where our blood pressure is just by looking at the bleeders in the subcutaneous space and knowing we've already injected epinephrine, which should narrow the bleeders. Uh, it looks pretty good. So the skin back here is very thick. And I've seen surgeons get lost doing this surgery, believe it or not. And the reason they get lost is they don't know where the spinous process is. The most important thing is to just go down on the spinous process, okay? When you have a, a heavier patient, you want to you want to really be careful not to miss the spine. <laughs> And, I, and, and we kind of, I chuckle about it, but only because I've seen it happen. Not with me, but with other surgeons. Where they're out in the, you know, they're looking at the operating room floor, which is bad, right? So that means they really miss the spine. And it's easy to do. So as a resident, when I was learning how to do this, I was told to palpate for the spinous process. And so that's what I'm doing, okay? All right, so you make your best guess with the skin incision and then you palpate. Our patient, you know, body habitus is one of a lot of soft tissue. So 
I have to figure out how to get down to the spine through all this soft tissue. Patients who are heavier also require bigger incisions, usually. Thank you. I use a guarded bovie tip. I like the charge concentration on the tip. What's bleeding here? Where's the ray tech? I'll take the ray. So we haven't gotten to our dorsal fascia yet. We're still in the adipose tissue. If you draw your retractors too tight, you'll never feel the spinous process. I think that's C7 right there. C7 is going to be the most prominent spinous process. So here, there's something bony right there. And I feel the spine there, the spinous process. is pretty deep. And there's the fascia. There's the spinous processes. I'm going to get a bigger retractor in, in a minute. All right, so for the viewers, we, uh, we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Atwater. We're happy to take questions from you uh, during the surgery if you have a question. But this part of the surgery we're doing right now is called the exposure. And as we've talked about before, every surgery that's ever done has an exposure. And some of them are less invasive than others, but it doesn't matter what kind of surgery you perform, there's always gonna be the exposure part of the surgery where you're getting down to the part of the body you're trying to fix. Whether it's the gallbladder or the, or the intestine, in this case, the spine. I can feel the tips of the spinous processes now. I believe I got C7 and T1. I don't know that for sure, and there's no way to know that until I find the T2 spinous process and until I find the T1 transverse process. But I can use those two landmarks instead of using x-rays to be sure of where I'm at, okay? I'm not ready for this yet. I just need a weedy. Thank you. The little retractor is called a Wheatlander. The big one is a Cerebellar. <coughs> They're pretty standard. We I do this surgery the same way on every patient because I like to have reproducible results. And the decision about what surgery to do is always made before we get to the operating room. So I've honestly probably once in my entire career ever had to tell a patient, oh yeah, I got in there and I found this and that and I had to do something different. I mean. If you plan the surgery out properly ahead of time, you know exactly what needs to be done. So I'm going through the dorsal fascia right now. And can we put the, oh, you've got it up there? How's the view up there? Good. All right, good. We have a question from our audience. Sure. One of our viewers is wondering, what are you doing right now and what are you trying to repair? So the, what I'm doing now is we're in the back of a neck and we're trying to repair the cervical spine. This patient has multiple disc herniations uh, causing narrowing of the spinal canal where the spinal cord and nerves are. So the spinal canal and, and the foramen. So the nerves and spinal cord are getting pinched and as a result, she's developing nerve dysfunction called radiculopathy and spinal cord dysfunction called myelopathy. So she's developing two problems, radiculopathy and myelopathy, and she also has pain as a result of deformity that she's developing, which is scoliotic deformity. So right now, we're trying to get down to the spine so we could operate on it. And I'm feeling the back of the spine with my fingertips right now, okay? So the first part of the surgery is the exposure, getting down to the spine. I'm gonna bend my bovi tip in a little bit at about, 10 degrees just to, just so I could peel the, um, the muscle off of the bone. We need more muscle relaxation, please, Dr. Fu. Um, so I would give her more now and then let it wear off, but I need it mostly in the beginning. I like the muscles to be isoelectric, meaning 
when I bovie next to them, and we don't need a lot, Dr. Fu, just a little bit. When I bovie next to them, I don't want to see them contracting. Most surgeons don't pay attention to that. But the reason for that, there's several reasons I like that. Number one, let me have a skin knife. Number one, if they're isoelectric, then their metabolic needs are not so great. So in other words, as I retract the muscle, they don't get any blood flow. And just like pushing on your skin, it turns white. Muscles will turn white because they don't get enough blood flow. So if your retractor is retracting the muscles to the side and it's putting more than the systolic blood pressure at that level on the muscles, you're not gonna get any blood flow. So some surgeons will take three or four hours to do the surgery and those muscles will be avascular without any blood supply. We call it ischemia. They'll be ischemic for three or four hours. They're gonna die, which is why in a lot of spine surgery, you look at the MRI after the spine surgery and you're gonna see uh, dead muscle, okay? I think dead muscle is one of the biggest problems from spine surgery, open spine surgery, that we, we are neglecting. And most surgeons don't think about it. But it's actually the source of pain as well after surgery is the muscles. It's not the bones, it's not the screws and rods. It's quite literally the muscles being inflamed and spasming. So the more, the more we protect the muscles during these surgeries with a posterior lumbar, posterior cervical, the, um, the faster the patient will recover with less pain and also, if you're not messing with the muscles during surgery, the, the, uh, you don't get the bleeding. The bleeding comes from the muscles. So the more your muscles are contracting, the more physiologically active your muscles are, the more blood that's gonna go there, the more bleeding you're gonna get. So it's a little secret that I developed over the years to reduce post-operative pain and dysfunction, to speed up recovery through therapy, and to minimize intraoperative bleeding and the use of narcotics after surgery, you protect the muscles with um, basically muscle relaxers, which the anesthesiologist gives. We still have a little bit of contraction. All right, we're going deeper and deeper. We knew this would be a deep dive because our patient is, has the body habitus with a lot of soft tissue. We still have a little too much contraction on the muscle. I'm wondering if we can't do a little more. Now this patient's never had surgery before. Another thing you need to know when you're doing the exposure is you wanna be between the muscle bellies. So that's why you wanna come down on the spinous process as well, the tips of the spinous process. You don't want, you don't wanna come into the muscles. You wanna come in between the muscles. And as long as you come down on the tips of the spinous process, you won't cut the muscles. This is gonna be a deep one, very deep. I can tell you that right now. We're already struggling with our visibility here and being able to see. There's nothing else I can do to make it better. Basically, I can just open the incision wider. And, you know, we wanna try to minimize how much we're opening the incision because the more incision you open, the more trauma to the soft tissues to get the job done. So we wanna balance the iatrogenic injury from the surgeon, the trauma, by cutting and dissecting with the need for visibility and safety for the patient's surgery to be done properly. And that's not easy to do. A lot of surgeons struggle with that, Cobb. So right now, I think I'm seeing uh, the C7 and T1 spinous process, which would be good from a standpoint of down here. We don't need to go any further south. But um, I think we have enough exposure north. I think we'll be fine. Remember, you want to stay between the muscles. Once you start cutting the muscles, you're going to get more bleeding and more pain, post-operative pain and suffering by the patient. So I'm in a avascular fascial layer between the muscles right now. And I'm seeing the spinous processes. I'm staying right on top of them. Remember, I'm gonna go north until I find C2. Now C2 is much bigger than C3 and C4 and C5. 
the spinous process of C2 is much bigger. And you know it's C2 for sure because you just palpate north of it and you get no spinous process because that's C1. C1 doesn't have a spinous process. C1 has a posterior arch. So C2 has the biggest spinous process, the tallest, and then the one above it has none. So you know it's C2 for sure. It's really hard to mess that up. But in case you do, you verify it down below by finding T1, which is the first transverse process. And we're going to see that later. How's the view? It looks excellent. Sorry about the depth of the f wound, but. So you can see we've lost almost no blood, right? There's no blood coming out. Now, if we didn't position this patient properly and if we weren't controlling their, their uh, blood pressure, I could, see, I could see the dura down there between the bones. So you just gotta be real careful. You can actually make a mistake and put your bovi between the lamina and you can bovi the dura and the spinal cord. Don't wanna do that. So you wanna stay on top of the lamina, which is what I'm doing. You, can you see through my view up there? Dr. Atwater, yeah. you see that right there, that white with the blood vessels on it? That's dura. So you can see how easy it is to make a mistake and get between those, those lamina. You just have to be super careful. key is to stay on the bone. So I'm dissecting the muscles off of my side of the spine, which would be the patient's left. Next, I'm gonna head over to Dr. Patel's side, my, part, my partner and um, assistant sur surgeon. And he's gonna, we're gonna, oh, uh, blood pressure must have come up a little bit. See that? We got a little bit of spontaneous bleeding. When the come off that, when the blood pressure comes up and you have to start chasing the bleeding, you basically stop operating. You're no longer making progress. So it's real important that we keep the blood pressure under control. Now I'm telling you this because the honest to God's truth is most surgeons don't pay attention to blood pressure. They just leave it to the anesthesiologist. And the anesthesiologist, they always wanna have higher blood pressure to perfuse the heart and brain. So they're always thinking protect the kidneys, protect the heart, protect the brain. Those are the tissues that need blood more than any other tissue in the body. The surgeon needs to be thinking, well, stop the bleeding. So we keep cutting these blood vessels and if the pressure's high, we're gonna bleed more. It's very simple. So you have to have a perfect balance of perfusion of tissues that are necessary so that you don't stroke somebody out or give them a heart attack and then at the same time, you don't want to bleed too much. Otherwise, the patient's recovery will be compromised and they can have other problems, including even perfusion problems and of tissues if you don't have enough red blood cells or volume. So I believe we're probably the only facility in the world that does outpatient posterior cervical laminectomy with fusion. And we've been doing this surgery seven years now, outpatient. We've never had a complication, not a single patient, not even a post-op complication. Do we have any questions, Sean, from our audience? So I'm right on the tip of the spinous process here. I don't know which one it is. I just know that it's still a spinous process. And we're gonna expose pretty much all the spinous processes here in the upper cervical and mid cervical spine. Even the lower cervical down to C7 and down into the thoracic, T1 and T2. So that's all I'm doing right now is peeling the muscle off of the spinous processes. And the way I'm doing it is a technique called subperiosteal dissection. I'm basically using my bovi and my retractor to gently retract and then um, cauterize, it's actually using plasma to cauterize the tissue.
and it uses heat. So we're basically, it's like a barbecue moving through here. Right, Dr. Fu? You like that? You're getting hungry, huh? Oh, shoot. What do you like to eat? A barbecue. Barbecue. <laughs> well, you're going to like the South. Where are you coming from? Is it Pittsburgh, or where are you at? Like, uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. All right. Well, you guys have the Philly cheesesteak, right? Yeah. Do you like Philly cheesesteak? Yeah, yeah, me too. I prob we probably don't have as good Philly cheesesteak here as Philadelphia. <laughs> but we've got Sonny's barbecue. So today's your easy day, Dr. Fu. Yeah, tomorrow you how many uh, no, the patient's not easy. That's that's why I'm saying it tongue in cheek. I'm joking with you. The patient is a challenging patient because of their size. I don't know what their airway was like. Airway's good. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a lot of obese patients in in? Uh, oh, okay. Well, good for you. Then it sounds like you're very qualified. The, we're in the South now, and a lot of people are obese, right? Even I'm obese, so I I'm, I'm count myself among them. I've been losing weight, but not fast enough to make my wife happy. She's always giving me a hard time. You need to exercise. All right, then I exercise. You need to not eat so much. Well, you know, what's, where's the pleasure in life? I don't drink, I don't do drugs. I mean, my pleasure is eating, <laughs> right? Huh? Ah, I don't think so, I enjoy my work, I love what I do. Yeah, well there was a time when I was working too much, but not now, I've settled, I've gotten back a little bit. Plus with COVID, we don't have, you know, as many patients having surgery as we, we did in the past. COVID is a buzzkill. All right. Yeah, the vaccine is out. I'm not going to be the first person to do it. <laughs> no, thank you. I already had COVID. I've been there, done that. So I don't think my body is going to get it a second time, but I guess it's too early to say. I don't think it mutates. I already had it. I had it nine months ago. Yeah, I had some symptoms. I had uh, uh, no real fever, low grade. I had uh, no, no airway symptoms. It was GI. Um, and it was only for a day. And then it went away. Did you get tested? Yeah, I got tested. Yeah, I have the antibodies. And I've done many tests since then with the PCR. Everything's negative. I don't. I don't. I don't think I would do the vaccine personally. I would. I would want to be certain that it's not going to have any untoward side effects, huh? I'm already immunized. True. I'm just thankful that I didn't have bad symptoms. You know. What do they think it is, a cytokine crisis or cytokine storm? Is that what they think does most of the damage? I haven't read about it lately. All right, you seeing what we got here? Yeah. Whoop. <coughs> okay, so if I had to guess, that may be seven or T1, six, five, four, three. We're getting close to two. So I don't feel anything here. This has got to be C2 right there, is what I'm thinking. We have another so question. Good. I'm not going to take any more of the muscle off C2 at the top. I'm just going to stay at the bottom. Yes. 
One of our viewers is wondering, will you be using a transitional rod if you're going down to T2 or just a 3.5 rod all the way down? No, we're not going to use a transitional rod. The screws that we're going to put in the thoracic spine and the T1 and T2 pedicle screws, they're going to be able to accommodate the same rod as the, as the lateral mass screws. It's from the same system and it's designed, they're all the same screws basically. What's the name of the system? Solanus. Huh? Solanus. 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 It's from AlphaTech, who I've told you all many times before, I absolutely hate them. They're a bunch of scumbag dirtballs, except for Amy. But their product is good. I've tried many different systems. I even developed the system myself. I developed a system years ago at Nuvasive. Their posterior cervical system is what I developed along with a couple of other doctors. So you know Steve Yanni? Do you know him? He's an orthopedic. I developed that system and uh, it's a good system but not as good as this one. So I don't even use the system that I developed. <sighs> So no, we're not going to use a transitional rod. We're going to use just a rod that has one dimension, one diameter, one, one uh, it's consistent throughout. All right, so we're making progress here. Again, you want to be careful not to plunge. I'm getting out to the lateral mass. I'm past the spinal laminar line. I can see the facet joints. The facet joints are very mobile. There's something wrong. They're not intact. They look disrupted, okay? Basically, they look uh, damaged, which is not surprising. There's always a history of trauma before any type of degenerative process. I don't know what her specific trauma history would be. I haven't elicited that from her. Do we know? Has she been in a car accident or something? Anybody know? What? Two car accidents? Oh. Well, there you go. So a whiplash could certainly disrupt the posterior facet capsule, and that's what it looks like. There's really nothing there. There's no capsule at multiple levels. So. We've lost probably five mils of blood so far. I don't expect to lose much more. So I probably will keep this under 20 mils, the whole surgery. All right, we believe that C2, then that would be three, four, five, six, seven. So we still need to go a little bit more posteriorly. I mean, super inferiorly. How close is this to our? The tape. It's on the tape? Yes, sir. All right, so let's have a knife. I'm gonna just take it right up to it. Do you have a stapler? Yes, sir. Let me have it. Thanks. Bovie. All right, I'm gonna be able to get my retractors deeper in just a moment. Now let's see what we can do here. Again, this is a tough surgery because of the that patient's amount of soft tissue, okay? I'm saying it in a nice way, but bipolar. There's a lot of soft tissues, which means we have a super deep wound. And deep wounds really just kind of what we call tax the limits of the surgeon's ability, not just physically and visually, but also our instruments are all made for, you know, average sized person basically. Now there are some instruments you can get that allow you to, to go deeper for deeper patients, but for the most part, your instruments are gonna be part of your limitation being able to get down 
all the way. But so far, everything's going well. I'm just gently retracting the soft tissues off the spine and I'm releasing them with the bovi as I slide along the bone. And we're gonna go lateral enough on every one of these cervical vertebrae. We're gonna go lateral to where we just get to the lateral margin of the lateral mass. And it starts to dive anteriorly. And it's important that we do that because number one, we need a, a surface to fuse. So you wanna expose all the bone to the lateral margin because we're only doing a posterior fusion here and not going anterior. So you only have the posterior surface of the bone to fuse and we're getting rid of the lamina. So you really only have the lateral masses to fuse. This is C3 here. So you only have the lateral masses and the facet joints that you can use for fusing. I wanna try to preserve C2-3. So three, four, five, six, seven, T1, and then we're gonna get down a little bit deeper lower to T2. Let's get your side and then we can reposition our retractors again. Sorry, Dr. Atwater. I, normally it would be an easier for you to see surgery, but I, uh, I thought we had a not as deep of a wound surgery. I'm thinking of somebody else. No, that's fine. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm seeing plenty. All okay. right. All right. Well, Is so we should. Was that a head cam? And then the other view of it's perfect. All right. Good. So when I get down to 7112, the um, blood vessels typically here, the um, arteries and veins that run between the interspinous ligament, between the spinous process, they get pretty robust. So I always like to come in and coagulate them with a, a bipolar first. Otherwise, you'll be chasing them out laterally into the muscle once you dissect it with the bovi and it bleeds and bleeds and bleeds. So you can avoid a lot of blood loss just by using a bipolar at the bottom here first. Louise, how's it going? We're good, thanks. Dr. Patel, you doing all right? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Patel is becoming a seasoned veteran. You know, you're lucky you only have to assist one surgeon, Dr. Patel. In residency, I learned, I had to learn from every surgeon what they liked and didn't like. Right? You know what I'm talking about, huh, Dr. Fu? Yeah, I probably Yeah. I, I can't do it. Right? It's like having, it's like having 10, 10 different girlfriends, trying to make all of them happy trying to keep everything straight, okay? That's what I had to do. And some of them were easy to get along with and some of them were bears, to say the least. I think I'm very consistent. If you do what I want you to do, we're fine. There was a little fat pad there that was developed, you see that? nice and juicy basically to support some inflammation all right I'm gonna reposition the retractors and now we're gonna go deeper we're basically almost at the end of our exposure how about something good I don't know something better than that sure scorpions are good We have another question. Of course, be happy to take the question. How's the view? Is it slid down or is it holding pretty good? No, it still looks very, very good. All right, good. Yes, what's the question? 
So we have a viewer saying, uh, I have a bulging disc at C3-4 and compressed disc at C5-6. The doctor I'm seeing now keeps saying that surgery is unnecessary. What is your opinion on this? All right, well, it sounds like you have two bad discs, basically. The real question is, what are your symptoms? If you don't have any symptoms, there's no neck pain, no headaches, there's no arm symptoms, there's no spinal cord symptoms, and you don't need anything done. If you're having symptoms from those discs, then you need something done. Now, the something is, is typically give it two months to heal on its own, but if you've had symptoms more than two months, it won't heal on its own, and you're going to need something done surgically. And that's where I'd recommend the Duke Laser Disc Repair. We're going to do a Duke Laser Disc Repair next surgery. So uh, I wouldn't get this particular surgery done for that problem. This is overkill. You don't need it. This is when you have lots of bad discs, like four or more in your neck. Suck, please. But the laser surgery we're going to do next uh, today would be the perfect surgery. So check it out, and then we'll talk about it later. But no, you shouldn't live with it. The, you know, what you're saying is something we commonly hear. And that is that, you know, patients with a specific problem, they go to different doctors, bipolar, and they get different opinions. And the truth is, is that most doctors don't know how to fix your problem. Most spine surgeons don't know how to fix your problem. They just don't. And they don't believe that surgery will work because they've not seen it work in their hands or they're taught that it won't work. But when you have a herniated disc or bulging disc and you've got neck pain from it, there's only one way to fix that neck pain and it'll stay there the rest of your life until you do it. And it's surgery on the disc. So the best surgery for a herniated disc is the laser surgery we're about to do next. It's the least invasive. There's no fusion done. There's no metal. There's no plastic. There's no cages put in. There's no bone graft. There's nothing. It's all natural. And it's done with a laser that repairs the annular tear and the disc herniation. That's what I would recommend if your disc is symptomatic. So we can tell you if the disc is symptomatic through a free Skype, um, a th a free Skype um, encounter, okay? We do those um, for free, and you're welcome to have it done for free. You just have to send us your MRI. Go to dukespine.com, free MRI review, and I'll be happy to personally look at your MRI with Sean, who's uh, our host, and we're going to review the MRI and then call you and do a Skype conference and we'll figure out if that's the cause of your pain or not. If it is, then I'd recommend surgery on them. Okay? All right. So I feel pretty confident we're down to, let me have a skin knife. I just need a millimeter more. Isn't that what everybody says? Take that. We just, we're, we've got our T1 and T2 transverse processes exposed on Patel's side. Now I gotta come over to my side. I need the, yes, perfect, Luis. Luis, amazing, great job. Anticipation. You're welcome. So good question. So the, to reiterate, there are millions of people, about 100 million people with chronic back and neck pain. and. Most every one of them, that pain is due to a herniated disc or bulging disc. Specifically, it's the annular tear that's the cause of the pain. And it may be one disc, two discs, three discs, four discs. Everybody's different, but the source of your pain may be as much as four discs, five discs. It could be as little as one disc. Everybody's different. So um, when your pain is coming from a bulging or herniated disc, there's only one way to get rid of it, and that's surgery on the disc. You have to... You have to either repair the disc, which is what the Duke Laser Disc Repair does, or you have to fuse the disc to get rid of the pain. I would not recommend the fusion if you can avoid it. It's much more extensive surgery. Now this patient here, not only did she have um, four bad discs, but she also had, has what's called congenital stenosis. She was born with a narrow spine. 
About 20% of the population has a narrow cervical spine. People get it in the lumbar as well and thoracic. And it's usually because they have short pedicles. She had congenital stenosis and now she has what we call acquired stenosis, which is from degenerative changes like thickened ligaments, buckling ligaments, um, deformity like scoliosis, lesthesis, kyphosis, they all co contribute to that acquired narrowing of the foramen. So Dr. Atwater and I were talking before surgery about how important fixing deformity really is in degenerative spine conditions. You wanna try to fix deformity whenever you can. All right, now I'm just gonna verify. This is C2. That would be three, four, five, six, seven, T1 and T2. I see the transverse process of T1 and T2. I don't see a transverse process here. I don't see a transverse process here, so that has to be seven. The next one is T1, and the one after is T2. Is my headlight getting too close to you, Dr. Patel, or are you good? Okay. Ooh, barbecue. All right. I'm up on a tower. Feels good, feels pretty good. I think we're ready. I don't even think I need to reposition. So three, four, five, six, seven, T1, T2, exposed on both sides. Maybe I'll reposition just one more time just to get it perfect. I'm a big believer in optimizing everything you do for patients doing it as very best as it can be done. Take the time to do it, and that way you don't have, you don't have problems later where you're wishing you had just done a little bit more exposure or a little bit more retraction or a little bit more dissection just to have it a little better. I've learned over the years exactly how much exposure I need. My only concern is my caudal exposure, but I can't do anything about it and that's because this patient has so much soft tissue. So at this point, different surgeons do this part differently, okay? But we need to basically remove the lamina, and then I'm gonna open the foramen as well. We're gonna remove the lamina at three, four, five, six, seven. We're not doing T1 or T2. There's really no, not any, let's see, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Six, seven is the last bad area. So we only need to remove seven, and we should be decompressed. Once we do our laminectomy, we're gonna take the lamina and spinous process out. Luis is gonna clean the soft tissues off of it, and that's beautiful autographed. We've got lots of stem cells and um, you know, nice trabecular bone to promote fusion. So it's got basically everything you need to make the spine fuse in that bone we're about to get out. A lot of surgeons come to this point, they get the bone out and they throw it away, okay? And then they use bone graft, you know, what's called DBM, uh, allograft. But I believe autograft is probably the best bone you can put back in a patient to promote fusion. So I do a combination of allograft and autograft, the DBM allograft and the patient's autograft, especially when they have really healthy bone. Her bone looks super healthy to me. So she's gonna have nice, diploic bone full of stem cells and scaffolding. And we've talked about this before, but you need three things to promote fusion. You need, um, you need uh, the right cytokines to promote fusion. Where's my pedal? Okay. Yeah. We call that um, osteoinduction. I need a cob probably. And then we need a scaffolding which is your, uh, which is your diploic bone, which you'll see shortly, which is osteoconductive. And then we need osteogenic cells, like stem cells that can make osteoclasts and osteoblasts. So we've got it all right here. All right, I'm gonna start at the spinal laminar line. So we got the lateral mass here, and it ends right there. That's the lateral aspect of the cord. And so I wanna 
You don't want to go into the lateral mass. That's a big mistake, all right? You want to make sure you, you just cut through the lamina, right? More conservatively towards the spinous process. We'll start at C7. Yeah, I don't need this right now. So I'm using a special drill. It's a spine drill, um, orthopedic drill, and it has a little bit called a neuro bit. It's a three millimeter neuro bit. It's the only drill bit I really use, except when I'm taking hardware out that I can't get out. I use another bit to cut through the metal. Notice how I'm drilling a little bit, and then I'm palpating with the tip of the drill. So uh, a surgeon that knows how to use these drills, we always feel with the tip. And Dr. Patel is doing a, a great job. There's the inner cortical table, and below that is dura. There'll be some ligamentum flavum as well. Here's the foramen, bottom of the foramen. Uh-huh, nice job. Uh-huh. All right, that should be good. A little piece there. Kind of going up into the next. That was seven. Six is here. So our goal is to remove this roof of the spine called the laminectomy. That will take the pressure off the spinal cord and in the back. And that will achieve one of our goals of decompression. The other is to unpinch the nerve roots in the neural foramen. He has uh, foraminal narrowing. All right, <clears throat> so that's two down. Just want to verify that we're through. Help me here. Okay, we're through there. Hold on. Through there. Oh, by the way, we're drilling on top of the spinal cord. So... You really want to be careful. Don't try this at home, <laughs> in your garage, kitchen table. This is pretty serious stuff. Just because you watch me do one doesn't make you uh, capable of doing it. So There's a lot of tactile you're not getting when you're watching. That's good. We're through. Are we bleeding a little? Let's have some bone wax on a stick. Now remember, she has healthy diploic bone. So sometimes you're going to get some diploic bleeding of the residual or laminar edge. And you can sometimes suck, please. Just use a little bone wax. You don't want to get too crazy with the bone wax because let's check it out. Let's go with gel foam. This looks like epidural vein, in which case you won't get with bone wax. You want to use some gel foam with thrombin. But um, you don't want to go too much bone wax because, because bone wax is going to block fusion. And you want these raw surfaces available for fusion. The more raw surface you have, suck here, that's good. The more raw surface you have available for fusion, the uh, more likely fusion will occur. Fusion is very surface area dependent. All right, we've done our osteotomies then at um, 765. What should we do there? Looks like a little bone wax, maybe. Looks like the ploic bone, perhaps.
What is this, a freer, Luis? Yes, sir. Yes. We use a freer. It's, they call it the dental tool, right? Isn't that the dental tool? Yes, sir. All right. Going to belly up to the bar here, and we'll get the next osteotomy done. This will be four. Oh, by the way, as you go further up, the lamina get thinner. So you want to pay attention to that. You want to modulate your depth of your drill. As you get up to number three and four, it's very thin. Okay. There's the dura. I have a little piece here that's still connected. You never want to push down. We have another question. Sure. One of is wondering, it's the same viewer that asked the question earlier about his C34, C56. Oh, in that case, they can't answer it. You're <laughs> only allowed one question. You got to put another quarter in the machine. Hmm. Yes, go ahead. He, he wants to know, uh, hypothetically, if he gets surgery done to repair those two discs, how long can he be expect to be out of work for both the DLDR and fusion? All right, if you were to come to Duke's spine and have your surgery done, how long would you be out of work? That's a great question. Everybody asks me that. The truth is, I can't answer it without knowing what kind of work you have to do. So if you, if you can go back to work and do what's called light duty, then you can go back the next day if you have the laser surgery done. We have most of our patients go back to light duty the next day. If you have a fusion done by me, you're looking at, if it's a lumbar fusion, you're looking at about uh, two weeks to a month to go back to light duty. And um, if it's a cervical fusion, an anterior cervical fusion, about the same. Two weeks to a month. Just depends on how you're feeling. Some people heal faster than others. But like I said, the laser surgery, you can go back to work right away. Literally the next day. Suck, suck. I'm almost done here on this side. I'm going to switch sides. This is the most cautious area, right? What happens if you injure the cord at C3? Your patient becomes quadriplegic and they require a ventilator the rest of their life. So that's really bad. I've never done that, never will. But that's something that you spine jockeys need to be aware of is, you know, just because we do these patient surgeries and make them look easy doesn't mean they really are. You have to be half a millimeter um, of, uh, I need the pedal, the drill pedal. You need a half a millimeter of precision in your work consistently. Uh, that's not where the pedal goes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. I got it. And die for your kiss. How are we doing down there? What's going on? All right. I only need the drill pedal. Y did you look in there? Where's that water? Do you look in there? What'd you think? All right, are you ready? So once again, seven, six, five, four, three. Are you ready? So again, you want to be conservative and, and err on the side of the lamina, not the lateral mass. I'm okay, Louise, thanks. All right, we got bone bleeding, diploic bone. I need a little bone wax. So you see that right there? That's classic uh, diploic bone bleeding. All you need is a little bit of bone wax, and that stops it. If you try gel foam, it won't work. If you try bipolaring, it won't work. If you try bowing it, it might work, but you'll be bowing the spinal cord. I don't recommend that. So the best is bone wax. And that's one thing that you need to learn as a, as a good spine surgeon is, is what's called hemostasis. And everyone just thinks hemostasis just means stop bleeding. It does. But what you need to understand is that different 
different tissues bleed differently. And you need to know the strategy that's best to stop bleeding depending on what's bleeding. And you have several tools available. You've been watching from the beginning, you've seen the tools. Bobby's Bipolars, Bone Wax, and um, gel foam and thrombin. Heck, in the old days, they used to tie, tie blood vessels off with suture. Thank God we don't do that anymore because it doesn't work very well. But the truth is, when I started my medical school training at USC in Los Angeles, they were still tying tissues with, with suture. I don't know why, but... Do you ever see that done? Turning off tissues for hemostasis? Really? Okay, careful with that. That's where I saw it, general surgery. I didn't see it in neurosurgery. Can you imagine tying off part of the brain to get it to stop bleeding? Yeah, so for those of you who are newer surgeons, you've probably never seen tying off blood vessels with suture, with silk suture, but that's the way it used to be done. And for 100 years, that's all spine surgeons had too, neurosurgeons could tie off the blood vessels. You just grab a big chunk of tissue and you wrap a loop of suture around it and tie it. And you can't cut through it. Otherwise, you're back to tying again. So there's been a lot of advancements to modernize these surgeries that make them much safer and, and more efficient for patients. Okay, last one. Careful. This will be C3. You can see the diploic bone. You see how there's a lot of poking. Careful. All right, that's loose. So now I've, I've basically osteotomized along the spinal laminar line. Don't worry, we'll get it. From C3 to C7. Now you want to cut the hooper and interspinous ligaments that are left with a scissor, a heavy scissor. We call it a mayo. Is this the same mayo that I had the other day? It needs to be tightened up. It's just not cutting. What did we do the other day? It was like a lumbar or something? I can't remember. Yeah, that thing needs to be sent out for repairs. All right, now here comes. Oh, well, we almost had it all out at one. Well, now the spinal cord's decompressed. Okay? So take that. Let me show you all. These are the spinous processes in lamina. You can see the ligamentum flavum there, yellow ligament. It's a bit hypertrophied. We're going to clean all that up and use it. All right, looks good. Let's see what we got there. It looks like a vein, huh? All right, so let's just put some gel foam on there. Gel foam, thrombin. So we're going to put a, we got a little epidural bleeding, not much. Don't push down on it. Suck it one more time so we can get the clot off. Remember, you can't put your gel foam and thrombin on top of a blood clot. It doesn't work. It has to sit on top of the bleeding vein or artery. So I see a lot of surgeons make that mistake. Push here just gently, gently, gently. Good. Suck here. Good. Looks perfect. Take. All right, I'm going to switch sides. Dr. Atwater, you're welcome to look in. You ready? I'm coming down. So I'm going to go back to my side, which is the patient's left. Be careful, Dr. Atwater. You can see the spinal cord, the dura. We've decompressed the central canal nicely. And now we're going to go and open the foramen up where they're narrowed in the back. And we've already done our proximal foraminal decompression with that um, osteotomy. Guys, just go ahead and take one of those steps down. Take your time. 
So, so far things are going pretty well. We've had maybe 10, 10 mils of blood loss. Now, Keith, watch the sterile field, watch your sterile field. Now, normally when this surgery is done in the hospital, surgeons lose 500 to 1,000 milliliters of blood. You've probably seen it. Yeah. It becomes just a bloodbath. You need Moses to part the Red Sea. So you see what positioning, proper positioning does, what proper blood pressure control, what proper muscle relaxation does. It's a totally different surgery. Yep. It's much safer for the patient. It's much, much um, safer here during the surgery because it allows the surgeon to focus on what needs to be done rather than hemostasis and eat irrigation first. And then it's better for the patient because you're not losing blood so they have an easier recovery, right? They got all their hemoglobin they need to oxygenate their wound and get nutrients and stuff. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So the first thing we do is hemostasis. So I want Dr. Atwater to see this once I get started. Pickups. Now you see the foramen, right? Do you see what's coming out of the foramen? I'll show it to you, right here. You know what that is? Yeah, that's the ligament and flabum. So the ligament and flabum goes lateral into the frame, becomes the foramen and ligament. That's hypertrophy. So it's pushing on the nerve root from behind, shoving it forward. So we're going to get rid of that. That's part of our foramenotomy. Is this a three? A three? I need a three, please. I'm going to try a three. See if we can get it in there. I may need a two. You really can't push on the spinal cord. It's illegal. It's a five-yard penalty. Do I want a Woody? Luis, I thought you'd never ask me. No, I don't need the Woody, not in the cervical spine. I don't put anything in there that uh, doesn't need to be there. Okay, so always upward pressure. There's the back of the frame and it's totally open. Nothing pushing on the nerve root. Now I'll go to the next one. It's got thickened ligament as well. Are you allowed to push on the dura a little bit? Yes, okay, but what I do is I, I make my goal no pressure on the dura and then inevitably you have to because you can't do a frame anatomy without pushing on the dura. It's a great song. More volume. But you see you also get some foramenal bleeding. That's just veins. That's good. That's good. Good. I, I, I need it. I need it. It's really hard with the angle. bit of an unusual angle because the wound is so deep. My target is so deep, so my entry, um, you know, tent uh, trajectory has to be modified. So I'm kind of more over the patel side. So there's a foramen decompressed. Let's have gel foam. A lot of people don't know the right way to do a foramenal decompression. They don't even know where the foramen is, but it's right here. It's very easy. Okay, don't suck on that. We have another question. Yeah. So one of the viewers is wondering, is it possible to repair bulging discs at C7-T1 and T1-T2 with laser surgery? She says, I already had an ACDF five years ago, but the surgeon didn't go down that low, and he won't do it posteriorly because it's too complicated. Yeah, that's a great question. My gosh, thank you for asking. So is it possible to fix a C7-T1, T1-T2 disc with laser through an anterior approach? And the answer is it depends on your anatomy. And so what I need to see is I need to see a, basically an x-ray, a lateral view of your neck, because it all depends on where your collarbone is. Your collarbone is what blocks surgeon's access anteriorly to C7-T1 and T1-T2. If you have a super long neck and a low collarbone basically, then we can do it. So I would need to see your MRI and I would need to see your x-ray. And we do free MRI reviews here at Duke Spine, gel foam thrombin, in case you're wondering. You just need to send it in through our website or our Facebook app, uh, or, or, or actually our Duke Spine app. We have an app for everyone that's interested, Duke Spine Institute app, it's free. You can download it from the Apple App Store or you can download it from the, uh, what's the other one, not Apple, um, Google Play. What is it? The Google Play Store. Google. Gosh. It used to be called um, 
the HP or not Hewlett Packard, but uh, PC, you know, so for the PC. Long story short, no matter what platform you have, we have the Duke Spinus 2 Dab. You can upload your MRI in there and you can learn more about the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Here's another foramenal stenosis on my side. And this is just arthritic stuff from the facet joint, gel foam. So I'm, I'm opening the foramen from the back. It's called the foramenotomy. And the surgery is called a laminectomy with foramenotomy. And we're doing this because she's got foramenal stenosis. She's not just the central stenosis patient. She's a foramenal stenosis. Again, more thickened ligament. Ligamentum flavum. Go from. We're going to be done in 30 minutes. Closed. I'm telling our anesthesiologist, Dr. Fu, tuck here, please. Gentle, gentle, gentle. Good. Take. Let's see that foramen right there. Let's see some rotation of the spine as well. Wipe. Let's see, do we get it all? Shell foam. So this lady had ligamentous buckling and stenosis all the way up from C3 to down to T7, or C7, sorry. I don't see anything at C23, so we're good. Now we're gonna put our um, screws in. And some surgeons will use fluoro, I don't. Uh, I was trained not to, and it's trained how to do it without fluoro. That said, I've never had a nerve injury or vertebral artery injury ever. And the key is, it's where you start your pilot hole and it's your trajectory. And of course, you have to compensate for rotation of the spine. And we're also monitoring just in case, which, you know, we're monitoring EMG, MEP, SSEP. Let me get one more. Thank you. Uh, maybe one more after that, sorry. Yep, all right. So, take it. We've finished our exposure. We've finished our decompression. And now we're gonna start with our instrumentation. That's where we put screws and rods in. So we're gonna put in what are called lateral mass screws. We're going to drill a pilot hole. I always start, I'll use this lateral mass for example. You look at the facet joint here at the bottom, you look at the facet joint here at the top, you basically go to the center of the lateral mass, medial to lateral, because remember we did the exposure all the way lateral, bottom to top, you find the center and then you cheat. A little bit inferior by a millimeter and a little bit medial by a millimeter. Now one of the reasons I told you I like this particular company is you see this drill bit, um, this guide, it's got these little spikes here. And they, they look just like spikes, but they actually are pointed outwards. So I have, my wife and I, we have these dogs, they're called uh, Doshkins or uh, Dachshunds. And they were really um, engineered by the Germans to hunt badgers. And if you've ever had them bite you in play, you'll see that their front teeth are pointed outward, forward. So they can actually grab a badger's, you know, hair or grab a badger's leg, whatever, and pull them out of the hole. So these teeth are also angled outward, so they grab onto the bone and they hold it. So usually they don't slide. All right, so there's C3. I'm gonna start with C3. And I'm angling 20 degrees out and 20 degrees up. And She's got really hard bone. So 20 out, 20 up. Okay. That's one down. That's C3. Here's C4. I like to go segmental. I feel the more points of fixation, the better. There's some rotation here. I can see it. 
And the other thing I like to do is kind of let the drill bit guide itself. Now I'm using a 14 millimeter bit. It's very important. You don't go longer than 14. Three, four, five. Some people will skip uh, one or two. That's fine. I don't. I like as many points of fixation as possible. More points of fixation mean a more stable construct. More likely it's not going to fail. At some point you may get some bone in there. It's better to just clean it out rather than be impatient because it will affect the way the drill performs. And uh, I've had it shift the drill bit out of alignment. See, there's, this is rotated a bit too, C7. Some do surgeons don't put a C7 lateral mass screw. I, I always do. I don't see any reason not to. Same thing, up and out 20, 20 degrees. Now here comes T1 and T2, okay? T1 and T2 are pedicle screws. They're not lateral mass screws. And you wanna make sure you don't hit the spinal cord, but your trajectory is different. Again, I let it crawl down the pedicle. All right. You can actually literally feel it crawl down the pedicle. And if you're gonna air, you want to air lateral to the cord, no matter what. 16? 16. I always put 16 millimeter screws at T1 and T2. Remember, never point them towards the spinal cord, no matter what you do. If you don't, don't get the pedicle, it's okay. I've never had a problem with it. But you don't want to get the spinal cord. That would be very bad. Okay, so if you don't get the pedicle, you've basically got a transverse process screw, and it's bicortical, yeah. and it's fine. It's not the end of the world. I've never had a junctional failure as a result of it, okay? Oh, it's tight. Really good purchase. You want to feel that purchase? Twist it. Purchase. That's some really nice tight purchase. That you know you're in the pedicle there. All right, you want to. You're just a couple millimeter inferior to the facet. Yeah. So the mm -hmm. That's where the pedicles are. Now we're going to do lateral mass screws. So these are angled completely different. They're up and out, 20 degrees. Okay. And you want to, these are 14 millimeters, by the way. I don't put 16 millimeter lateral mass screws. You, I've never had a problem with 14. I know I go bicortical sometimes. I can feel it. But I've never had a nerve root injury. I've never had a 14. vascular injury with 14. But I would never go 16. 14 is it. You could probably even get away with 12 millimeter screws. Make sure you don't seat them on the bone, otherwise they lose their polyaxiality. So you want it to be able, the head of the tulip to be able 14. to move, move around and grab the rod and reduce the spine to the rod. You can see the facets moving. And we're gonna drill those facets out so we can fuse them. I'm going to go for a fusion 14. on the top of the lateral mass, but also in the facet joints. Uh -huh. Yeah, the hardware won't last forever. These screws and rods will fail eventually. They're just not designed biomechanically to survive the lifetime of a patient. They're designed really to survive long enough to let the body fuse the bone. 14. Let me see. That may be okay. I may have to seat it a little more. And this gets tricky around 7-1 because a lot of surgeons won't even put a 7 in because they, they, they have a hard time getting the rod to go from 7 to 1. But I've done it enough times. I know how to set the heads and the angles perfect so they line up for the rod. 
All right, so half of our screws are in. Now we're going to put the other half in. Now for those of you who have been paying attention, you noticed when I drilled the T1 and T2 pedicle screws, I didn't do more than a 14 millimeter drill bit. That's all I got. I never changed it to 16, but I still use a 16 screw. And that's perfectly fine to do that. All right. I can feel it crawling. And what I mean by feel it crawling, I'm talking about the bit, the drill bit, literally pulls its way through the diploc bone, pulls its way, way down the cortex, like a sandwich between the cortex. And it just grabs the cortex and it pulls itself. And that's what you really want. Up, up and out, 2020. seven again very difficult to do but you can get it just right and then t1 and t2 see how it grabs and pulls that was our waveforms Thanks. Yeah, nice. Perfect. Both are in the pedicle. Thanks you can me. feel it. Now some, uh, uh, are these self-tapping screws, you know? So they're self-drilling, self-tapping? That's why I never had a tap. Just have to have strong fingers. <laughs> strong fingers. That's all. Strong fingers. Any questions from our audience, Sean? None of this currently. You all know everything. So we're going to do a 14 up at C3. Now, once again, you don't absolutely have to put in every single segment. I don't think that's necessary, but if you don't get um, screws in the middle of the um, construct and fixate them to the rod, you get a phenomena called snaking. That's okay. where the spine will actually snake between the points of fixation at the ends. So it's better to have, to have full control over the patient's alignment and keep it stable so the spine fuses properly. You want every single mobile segment, you want a point of fixation. We have a question. Yeah, irrigation. Our viewers wondering, how much is this patient going to lose motion in their neck? How much motion is the patient going to lose? That's a great question. It's a complicated answer. So normally you have 50% of your rotation and flexion extension are at C1, or sorry, occiput C1 and C1, C2. The rest is in the subaxial spine, below C2, okay? So we're basically working below C2. So they're gonna have 50% of normal motion. But here's the thing. 14. The patient never had normal motion when she came to me. And anybody that has this surgery, they don't have normal motion. Otherwise, they wouldn't be getting spine surgery. If they can move their neck normally, without any neurological compromise or pain, they wouldn't be here. So everybody that has this surgery already lost motion. And what I find, believe it or not, it's absolutely insane to think about it, but 
this, she's going to have better motion after the surgery than she did before, once she's healed. Of course, we'll keep her in a collar, so her motion will be limited initially 14. for six weeks. But after that, when she does a therapy, she'll have better range of motion after this surgery with fusion than she did before. And the reason is simple. The pain will be gone, and the neurological compromise will be gone, exactly. It's pretty shocking, but it's real. And it's not something that I dreamed up, it's something I've, I witnessed. To my own surprise, to be honest with you, because I expected the, w the movement to be horrible. And the question a lot of people have is, can I drive a car after the surgery? And the answer is yes, when you're healed, you can drive a car. As long as you can look in the side view mirror, rear view mirror, and the blind spot. All right, we are done placing our screws. Now we're gonna mobilize the heads to line them up so we can figure out how long of a rod we're gonna need. And then we're gonna cut this rod with a very sharp cutter. We actually lost one of our employees once with a severe injury from the rod cutter. They bled to death. Doctor, Dr. Atwater knows better than that, but are you ready? So we're, we're gonna hold the rod and we're gonna cut it. You ready? Don't cut my finger. Oh, my finger! I've never gotten anybody with that, except one person. I think it was Cuppinger, wasn't it? Jordan Cuppinger. He was doing anesthesia. I think he, yeah, he freaked out appropriately. He was so worried about me. He's the only person that's ever really cared about me. All right. So we put a curve. Remember, we want the, the spine curved back, and we can only reduce her deformity. She didn't have that much scoliosis or kyphosis, but we are limited in how much deformity correction we can get because these patients are all um, pinned, okay? But we can get deformity correction after we get her out of the pin. If we contour the rod properly, then she can actually um, reduce her spine to the rod. And as long as we're happy with the rod contour, she'll get realigned after she gets out of the Mayfields because the spine will reduce to the rod. All right, we're just about done. This contour looks pretty darn good. What I don't want to do is I don't want to create kyphosis. So I, wanna, I want there to be a little bit of distance between the bottom of the rod and the tulip head so that the spine comes back to it, so that we get a little more lord, uh, lordosis. Now we're instrumenting from C3 to T2. Good. It looks good. Looks good. Yeah. So now we're going to put set screws in. Huh? What's that? Yeah. Yeah, with a drill. Yes. Yeah. Everyone does this differently. You're right. Thank you for asking. Um, some surgeons actually do the bone work. Everyone does this differently, okay? Some put hardware in first, then take the lamina out or do the bony work. I do it this way because I think this is, in my opinion, the best and safest way of doing it. It doesn't mean someone else's way isn't right. I always say there's a thousand ways to do a fusion and about three of them are right. The rest are wrong. <laughs> but that leaves room for three. Three different techniques. You don't want to cross thread your screws. We got one more to go and we're done. All right, good. 
Let's have the needle holder. We've literally lost 10 mils of blood. Dr. Fu, great job. What is Great job. No, no, you do, you're doing a great job. Thank you. You're part of the reason. I need to sink this screw in deeper. I need that screwdriver. We had another question. Mm -hmm. and thousand mils. I know. I know. I tell everybody that. No, I need the. So it's the way I position. It's the use. It is. All right. The blood pressure control. The blood pressure control, very yeah, important. Uh, control, uh, you know, very the blood pressure is essential. To, to, to the blood pressure is, I think, one of the most important. But you're doing fantastic. All right. Sorry, Sean, go ahead. That's okay. We just have a viewer wondering, uh, is it okay for them to get in and out and drive a truck after a surgery like this? Uh, I didn't hear the question. Is it okay for them to drive a truck? Yes, and also get in, in and out of the truck. Uh, what kind of truck? Like a semi-truck? They did not clarify. Um, honestly, I don't know if it's a semi-truck they're talking about, but yes. I mean, the answer is yes. You can... If when I when I do the surgery for you now it's not the same with other surgeons okay when I do this surgery the way I do it three months after surgery you can do whatever you want whatever you want okay let me have a bender actually we have to cut first let's go ahead and cut just a little bit we'll probably have to recut but the answer is um, yes you'll be <laughs> I hope I don't cut it too short but go ahead. You'll be able to, to drive a truck, any kind of truck you want. You could even load and unload a truck. But you've got to give your spine time to heal. The healing is really the bones healing. The muscle healing takes, you know, four weeks to heal. That's where you get your pain after surgery is the muscles. But the bone healing is you want your bones to fuse together solidly before you start loading your, your spine a lot. Otherwise, you'll get a failed fusion. If there's, you start creating too much movement, between the vertebrae, they won't they won't fuse. You'll get scar tissue. All right, I cut it really. I was very, uh, what do you call it, conservative. I may need to cut it one more time, but let's just at least get this out. If you have too long of a rod, you'll start tearing up the muscle at the bottom, and it'll start bleeding. I want to avoid that. It's perfect there perfect there if I do it this way we'll get some kyphosis which I don't want so I need to bend it a little more a little more volume please everybody like Guns N' Roses Dr. Fu Guns N' Roses yeah. nice I like you Dr. Fu Did you bring your family with you? Yeah. Uh, are they, what are they doing? Shopping? That's perfect. Are they gonna go to, to Disney or Universal or something? Yeah. All right, that will pull that up. That will derotate that. We have a little bit of bleeding from somewhere. Let's see where that is, let's suck. It's coming from up here. I think it's from right here. See it? You see it? I don't see it. All right. Let me have a rod holder. You found it? Okay. Where's my bovie? Nice job, Dr. Patel. I love the persistence. The key is you don't ever want to touch your bovie on coagulate onto the skin. You'll get an area of the wound that will never heal. Are we okay? Still going? Let me just look at this real quick. Am 
I going to pull that back? I need a little bit more there. All right, where is it bleeding? Bovi? You see it somewhere? No? Good? Thunder? Yes, good or no? All right, so we're contouring our second rod, last rod. And we're going to put our set screws in and then we're going to tighten everything up. I don't use a cross link in the neck like I do in the lower back. The rotational forces just aren't great enough to really necessitate it, in my opinion. All right, let's see. That will definitely pull that back. I may want to unbend the bottom just a little bit. Let me have the bender. All right, we're ready for our set screws. You can see the, everyone sees the spinal cord, right? I want to irrigate in a minute. I need to push this rod north. Let me have a, let me have the uh, needle holder. I don't need a persuader, not yet. should be good, right? That looks pretty good, right? Maybe there. Yeah. Is that loaded here? Gosh. I'm barely where I've got two step ups and I'm literally Anything cross-threaded you can see? I don't feel cross-threading. I don't see cross-threading, do you see? Everything looks good? It feels good. I may need a persuader here. I may, but I may not. Let's see. I may, I think I will, but let's see the set screw. First the set screw. Yeah, I need a persuader. Okay, so let's have a little irrigation next after I do this. I think this is my last screw. So this is C7, T1. And this is the one that, to me, looks a little rotated. So it's just not quite catching. I don't think I'm going to get it. Oh, actually, I feel like I got it. Got lucky. Better be lucky than good, huh? Let's see what we got. Does that look cross-threaded? It doesn't look cross-threaded to me, Patel. What about you? Irrigation? Looks good? All right, counter torque wrench, final tightener. Let's get rid of the bender. So we're going to tighten everything up with a tension limiting driver. The key is you don't want it to, you don't want it to the driver to slide up and it's really easy to strip as you know when you got stainless steel versus titanium the stainless steel always wins stainless steel is a much harder metal so you want to be really careful as you do this not to allow movement all right I love the design though the uh, screw to driver interface is amazing. This, with these, this star shape is my favorite. It just has so many points of contact, you know? It just really allows you to distribute the load equally onto the set screw head, unlike the, the hex, which a lot of, of these systems have. <sighs> Thank you. 
Last one on the right. Sean, any questions? We're going to be closing soon. We have our grafting to do, and then we're going to close. No other questions. We got irrigation. By the way, if you're wondering, that is the, the dura and the spinal cord, folks. The cervical spinal cord. You all see that down there? Sean, view good? Uh, yes, it's just when your hand's in the way when you're screwing, that's all. I'll let Dr. Patel tighten the lumbars. The problem is the view is so limited here. It's really the only, I can only, only one person can really see. So I can't take a chance of not having, having visibility of what's being done. Uh, and Dr. Atwater and I had a great conversation earlier. We were talking about the history of spine surgery with instrumentation and fusion. And a long time ago, neurosurgeons only did the decompression. And then the orthopedic would come in and do the instrument of fusion. And over the years, that's changed to where some certain places, and it's all political, at that university who has the power to control spine. And at UF in Gainesville, where I went, the neurosurgeons did. They had the, the authority to, uh, to do all the spine. And it has to do with privileging and call, things like that. I think I already got that one. We're good, yeah. Irrigation. And we'll probably need a few gel foams after I'm done. So we, we usually irrigate with betadine, folks. Why? Because NASA developed it. It's really good at killing pretty much everything. Viruses, bacteria, protozoan, fungus. It's the uh, universal sanitizer. So we used to do bacitracin and saline, but then I guess they decided bacitracin is not necessary anymore in surgical irrigation. Did you know that? I mean, I was doing it for 24 years, and then I just changed last year because of those paper that came out saying there's no benefit to adding bacitracin. So, I'm gonna decorticate. Let's see, go ahead and put your suckers back on. Can you guys see okay through my view? Yes, we can. Yeah, so we're gonna decorticate, and then yeah, then we'll go ahead and put in the, uh, the, the uh, graft. Where's my drill? There we go. Woo! Yep. All right, let me have you hold this for a moment. So obviously you don't wanna hit the spinal cord while you're doing this, it would be really bad. So you gotta really pay attention, not just to the tip, but to the shaft. And I'm gonna decorticate the lateral masses as well as the inner facet space. And I apologize if my hands get in the way Suck here, right here. Now, if you start getting bleeding during this from the bone, you don't want to use bone wax. You want to use uh, gel foam and thrombin. Gel foam and thrombin don't stop fusion. And if you're wondering, like, what can you do to get better at this kind of stuff using a long drill? I say play pool. I was a pool player in college. That's what I did in my limited amount of free time. I went to the pool hall. Did you hustle? I didn't hustle because I, I wasn't that good. Um, but I got okay. I wasn't, certainly it wasn't at the caliber of the hustlers, you know. But I would have loved to have, you know, made some money there. There were some people that were better than me, that's for sure. Um, but I love pool, you know, and the idea of holding a cue and using it in your hands. Did you play? Uh, the one time, not that much, but never got really 
good. Yeah. What sports did you play? Uh, tennis. Oh, wow. My dad was a tennis player. All right, we're done on one side. We're going to do my side now. Let me just look and see. <coughs> okay. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Who's moving? Are you moving the patient? I want to make sure she doesn't move. We got to make sure she stays, you know, non-moving. I don't mind if you let her twitches come back, but we cannot let her move in pins. No matter what, that would be really bad. Suck, please, ahead of me. So I'm going to hold the meat over. I'm going in the facet joint. And I'm going above the lateral mass. The truth is, folks, with the amount of instrumentation I've got in here, those joints are going to fuse very nicely with minimal, you know, decortication. All right. Bone graft. We're going to put some graft in. Uh, I need gel foam. Dr. Patel has started up some bleeding. Not much. Did you start that up? No. <laughs> Did you eat those cookies? No. Thank you. Let's see to do the other side. Just, just to keep the graph off the dura. Any questions from our audience? Sean? Not currently. Okay. Well, if they have questions, they know they can ask. So for those of you that joined us late, we're doing a posterior cervical laminectomy infusion with instrumentation. And in the laminectomy, we're adding a foramenotomy, which we've already done. And for those of you new to spine surgery, I don't need that. I need the woody. For those of you new to spine surgery, there's really three things spine surgeons do. They're supposed to do, at least. Um, number one, decompression. That means get the pressure off the nerves. Why would you need to decompress? Well, if your nerves are getting pinched from narrowing, or your spinal cord's getting pinched from narrowing, narrowing is called spinal stenosis. And the second thing surgeons, spine surgeons do is, is we realign the spine, put it back into its alignment that it's supposed to be. And it's very important. And Dr. Atwater is a surgeon who also very seriously takes that into consideration. But many of the surgeons don't. Right, Dr. Atwater? Uh, I can speak for the other surgeons, but yeah. it's been an issue. It's been an issue. I'll say it. They don't. You know, I know surgeons doing lumbar fusions on a, they do them on a Wilson frame <laughs> or on a flat table. Of course, the patient's going to be kyphotic to straight flat back when they're done because they didn't use the right table to do the surgery. You need a Jackson table. So realigning the spine, very important, and then uh, stabilizing. And the way you stabilize the spine, if it needs to be stabilized, is usually, you know, fusion or an inner body device you know, something. Uh, there's different things, but fusion is probably the most common form of stabilization. And you could also use instrumentation, which is screws and rods, but they will okay. fail. I need that. They will fail because they're not designed biomechanically to last more than, say, a million cycles. You know, some patients don't need more than a million cycles, but um, usually biomechanical testing for FDA clearance requires, isn't it a million cycles? A million cycles for approval. So, a million cycles of movement. All right, we're almost done with our grafting. That is our last step before closing. We've already tightened all the metal screws. We've already done our decompression, and now we are, uh, are going to close up. Sir, we're closing. We'll be closed in about 15 minutes. 
So we're going to put some, wait, let's get a little more gel film on there, sorry. We're going we're gonna to put vancomycin, one, uh, 500 milligrams, right? Yes, Not one gram. Yes, we used to put a gram of vanc, and then we would get this localized red man syndrome on the skin. And so for the posterior cervicals, we cut back to half a gram. But for lumbar, we do one gram. And I think the reason is the, the lumbar is deeper. This patient doesn't have a depth problem, but uh, we've just gotten into the practice of using 500 milligrams rather than a full gram. And that's the white powder. So why do we use this antibiotic vancomycin? Well, it's simple. It prevents deep wound infections, and it really works. I've been using this now for 12 years, and we've had literally no infections in 12 years with posterior lumbar and posterior cervical surgeries. So it's pretty incredible how effective it really is. And like I said, in the lumbar, we'll do a, I need a pickup okay. with teeth. We'll do a full, uh, a full gram for a one level lumbar, and then for a two or three level lumbar fusion, we'll do two grams. So here I'm injecting expiral into the paraspinous muscles. This is going to make the paraspinous muscles feel better. I'm injecting Exporol, doctor. Ah, of course, I have to get bleeding with the injection. Let me have a bovie. Incredible. Just bad luck. Take, watch the needle. Okay. I've got my bovie. We're going to find that little venous bleeder that I just created. Take. You want to do the your, my side? So we use this. It's basically non-narcotic. It's a local anesthetic, a local analgesic. So it really, you know, helps the patients with pain in their muscle after surgery. And because it's liposomal, it's got fat. It holds the drug there for three days, up to three days, 72 hours. So their patients getting local analgesia, which is not narcotic based, it's very safe. They're getting it for up to three days after surgery. That's when the muscle spasms are the worst after this kind of surgery. So this drug has really helped us manage patients well after surgery. Careful with your staples here. How are you doing? All right, now we're gonna start closing. We're gonna put a drain in. You got the drain ready? All right, let me see. Uh, you got it? Okay, good. 15 blade. So I'm gonna make a puncture with the 15 blade lateral to the primary incision. And I'm gonna make it big enough to get the waste of this thing in, okay? Of course. Suck, please. No, I just... Everything wants to bleed today. Oh no, patient comes back. One and one. Sweet Jesus. Uh, tomorrow. You got it? Get it in there. Can you see? Take. Every posterior cervical, posterior lumbar gets a, a drain. Every one of them. Post op day one. They all come back the next morning and get it out. Yeah. Perfect. Now you don't want to sew the drain in. That would be really bad. Let's have a weedy. So no more blood loss. We're closing. We've had what, 10, 10 mils maybe? At most, 15. Ooh, he looks like he wants to bleed. Let me have a bovie. Yes, sir. Take. All right. So first layer we're going to close is the fascia. You don't want to close muscle, suture. Now the fascia is deep here in her. 
So I can see it right here. It's very thick. You want what? Yeah, yeah, go, go. Thank you, Dr. Patel. American pie. You want to just make sure you don't sow that drain in, folks. It would really suck. Let's see if I can do it without this. Mm. So I'm going to go north of the drain for right now. My God. Good. It's so hard to get down there. Stay off the round part. Just stay on the flat part, okay? Yes, if you sow the drain in, we'll be back again tomorrow to take it out. I've never sown a drain into my career. I don't plan on starting today, but it's something you always have to think about. Now tell me more about your training. Okay. Uh, Ortho neuro. Yeah. I may need a back. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but the neurosurgeons would come in and do the decompression. Okay. So it was definitely a, a charge five set at the time. Did the neurosurgeons let you do a little, little bit of the work? Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you're a good fellow and they like you. They yeah, of course. Work and I was one of the good fellows. Good. Yeah, that's it's so political, you know. Yeah, it was definitely. Yeah, we had a few orthos on faculty in neurosurgery right. when I was a neurosurgery resident. They weren't even part of the ortho department, they were part of the neuro department. Right. 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 We had five faculty in, or on in spine surgery, five spine surgeon faculty when I was at UF in Gainesville. Did you guys do the deformity with them or was that? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't do uh, juvenile. We didn't do pedi pediatric. That went to uh, a guy named Mike McMillan. He did it. He was an orthopedic. So I guess, I guess you could say we did. I just didn't do much myself. And then it, he had his own fellow. So it was like, I wasn't that interested in doing pediatric deformity anyway. And that's his own kind of special niche. I don't do any pediatric deformity now. I send them all out. That was my major interest, but uh, yeah. when I got into practice, it mm -hmm. hard to do it unless you're at the uh, associated care center. Yeah, because they have to go to the ICU. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Look how dry that wound is, huh? Impressive. Yeah. You know, it's something that we've shunned away from in the outpatient setting. I mean, we're yeah, doing of course. ACDS, we're doing some anterior, some lateral. Well, we're the first in the world to do this. 
outpatient. This is over 100 cases here at the center. Not a single transfusion, not a single hospital transfer. They just go all like this. Look how big this patient is, you know? It's not an easy case, and yet we're doing it. Yeah, but if you had some choice of whether you're thinking about a needle that went into your current or what would be a challenge, like you've done with the dysphagia, the swelling, the swelling. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This patient won't have any d dysphagia. No. Oh. We don't know each other that well. <laughs> Does your wife know? <laughs> yeah, I like the fact that you can, you can joke and, and have fun. Oh, shit. Well, both of them or just one? Really? That's not good. I can move. I'm going to move and I'll let you get in. We need help over here with the IV. I can't have this patient wake up in pins. I need help over here. Get the light on. I need help for Dr. Fu. Yeah. I'm going to move out of the way. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Atlin. Go ahead and cut those. All right. If you can't get it quickly... You may have to get one started in the foot, okay, Doc, Dr. Fu? You may have to start one in the foot if you can't get IV access. Let's get the light on. Where's Ann? I'm going to keep working then. Give me a stitch. Pick up. How many stitches do you have left? Good. Oh, we got to move. This ain't no joke. He doesn't have IV access. Is that too long? Uh huh. Hold on, let me just verify here. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're good. You want to tie? Yeah, that would be helpful. Here. It's funny because I've always had a PA helping me mm -hmm. for years, and um, only recently I've not. And so I've had to do my own tying and my own posing. And Dr. Patel's not quite up to speed yet, you know? Yeah, your hand's been out of practice from the time, so you know what I mean? I have a PA and nurse practitioner who goes on the time. Exactly, right? Dr. Fu, are you okay? Um, you want a nurse starting an IV in the foot? So what can we do to help? Go ahead. Dr. Fu, what's going on? All right, I want to try to keep her blood pressure down. As I'm seeing, I know, we need to get an IV in her foot. So for those of you watching, we've 
her IV has stopped working, which happens in surgery. Sometimes you don't want it to, but we had two IVs actually, and both of them are not working. So at this point, we need to start a new IV in her foot. It can get really bad real quick. Let me tie this one. Oh, don't tell me I got an air knot. Yep, I screwed that one up. All right, go ahead. Stitch. Is Ann here? And what are you working on? Okay. Who's working on an IV in the foot? I don't care. You try. Somebody needs to try. I don't want any excuses. Do your best. Get it exposed. If you need Luis to move the we're almost done. We'll be we'll be stapled in less than five minutes. Yeah. Can you disconnect everything from the machine? Yes. I mean like the power thing. Yes. Make sure that doesn't hit that tube. Sitch. How many more you got? Oh we have ten more. Perfect. One more here and then a drain. I need a scissor, heavy. Scissors? Next. Uh, I need a scissor next. I need one more stitch and then a heavy scissors. Can you? I'll, I'll, I'll have her done here in a minute, in five, five minutes and a bandage on in 10, okay? I need a drain stitch. You want to do those? He needs scissor. Give him scissor. Scissor for him. Thank you, Dr. Atwood. We don't normally lose the IV, but stitch. Watch that scissor. Don't let it fall. How are we doing, guys? Guys, how are we doing? Okay, I need the scissor. need a scissor as soon as you're done. Thank you. I'm going to want a, a wet dry. Actually, a stapler first. You guys got good access now? Yeah. All right. Thank God. What? Are you asking? No, no. It's up to Dr. Fu. They're almost done. Stapler? Let me have a Adson if I need it. Okay. 
Nice job, doctor. Thank you for your help. Wet dry. Well, let's get her recovered. Dry. You have a little polysporin. You have that, uh, what's it called? Scissor. Do you have the uh, the little benzoin? Go ahead. No, 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 we don't need that. Right above my finger. Stereo strips. Let's do one more right through the middle. Uh, no, I want oh, okay. I want uh, the the four by fours. Oh, good. Yeah, the paper tape ready with the scissor clean. I need a, a lap. Where's the drain? I need the drain. I need a lap, a lap. Careful. Nice and straight. Let me have the lap, a, dr a clean lap. All right, you guys ready for the drapes to come down? Hold your hand there. Hold it right there. Let's go drapes down. Watch the tube. I don't want to pull the tube out. I need the scissor back in a minute. Watch the tube. Everybody watching the tube? The endotracheal tube. I need the bed ready. I need the bed ready to come in. All right. Let's get this out. Let's get this off. I need the the benzoin and the uh, scissor and the paper tape. Benzoin, scissor, paper tape. Paper tape Where's my paper tape? tape? Two inch paper tape. Where's my benzoin, guys? That? Jesus. We need probably more than one. We don't have another one, you guys. Uh, this is what you guys have been using. I can order. Uh, do you want to be around for this baby? Uh, what I want is um, a little more than this. So two of these, perhaps. That's good. That's good. We're good. Let's get this off. I'm gonna put this bandage on, and then we're gonna get her out of pins, and we're gonna roll her onto the gurney. Okay. Yeah. Give me a second. I'm gonna put the paper tape on. All right. Good. Uh, that's what we we're using. That's fine. That's fine. Let me have it. Let me get the bottom first, right where your hand is. Let me have it. I don't like it unwound that much. No, you can give Tordal. As long as your blood pressure is controlled. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so folks, I'll come and answer some questions in a moment. All right, everyone, Dr. Duke will be joining us in the room momentarily to answer your remaining questions. If you look on the screen now, we have the patient's MRI report up. You can see that the study does indicate the levels we just operated on were herniated and the likely cause of her symptoms. 
We hope after this surgery she'll be completely symptom free and we'll follow up with her on a different day where she can deliver a testimonial either after surgery or in the doctor's clinic. Please type up any remaining questions you have now and the doctor will answer them shortly.
All right, everyone, thank you for joining us for the post-op Q&A. We have Dr. Duke in the room with us now, ready to answer your questions. Uh, we currently have one question from our audience member on Facebook who asked Dr. Duke, how do you know that the laminectomy will suffice to cure the radiculopathy when you use no cages or autograft? Okay, great question. How do we know from our viewer, and our viewer is from, you said Facebook? The viewer says, how do you know the laminectomy will cure the radiculopathy without the use of cages or autograft, correct? Or okay. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, writing up a question. I love questions. I think it's great opportunity for everyone to learn. Um, <coughs> so let's, let's take the question. How do we know this surgery, the laminectomy, will cure the radiculopathy without something else being done and we'll address the something else in a moment so the nerves that are being pinched we know they're being pinched in the neuroforamen and the neuroforamen is what we opened up with the surgery today and we actually did two things to open up the neuroforamen we did a laminectomy, which opens up just the medial or inner part of the foramen and then we did a foramenotomy which opens up the lateral part of the foramen, okay, where the nerves are being pinched. And we know the nerves are being pinched there because of the MRI. So MRIs are a really useful preoperative tool that we surgeons use in figuring out where the patient's problems are coming from. The MRI never tells you where pain comes from, but it tells you where nerves are getting pinched. It tells you where the spinal cord is getting pinched. You can actually see the pinching on the MRI. And a lot of times you can see um, herniated disc pinching the nerves or ligament pin pinching the nerves or uh, bone spurs or the scoliosis or listhesis. So it depends on what's pinching the nerves, but it's usually identifiable on the MRI before surgery. That's what we did with this patient. We knew ahead of time that the nerves were being pinched in the foramen by the um, narrowing of the foramen in the back um, by the ligament that was pushing on the nerves, which we removed, the ligamentum flavum, as well as um, the, um, she had a short pedicle, so it basically brings the lamina closer to the nerve root uh, because the pedicles were short. She was born with short pedicles. And so we removed the lamina in the back and basically we know we've un unpinched the nerve root. Um, I could feel the foramen when I put the kerosene in there, that was the tool I used to remove the ligament. Um, kerosene punch is what it's called. So I could feel with the foot plate that the nerve root was, was decompressed after I took those bites of the foramen out from the back. So first of all, we didn't just do a laminectomy. We did a laminectomy and foramenotomy on both sides. So it's the foramenotomy that really does the unpinching of the nerve in the foramen. And otomy means to open, remove. So foramenotomy means to make a hole in the foramen, and we did that through the back. Now let's address the, the question about um, the use of cage or, or graft. So we actually did use allograft in this case. I don't know if that was unclear, but we did take the patient's own bone and we, we ground it up to be used uh, for grafting for fusion, but we also added in there something called DBM, which is demineralized bone matrix. It's produced by companies, they sterilize it, and then they provide it in the operating room. And we use it as bone graft extender. So it provides basically scaffolding. And um, combined with the autograft that we, we morselized, the local autograft, which had uh, stem cells and, and stuff in it, we were able to combine the allograft and autograft together. That's what I packed in. If you remember near the end of the surgery, I was putting something back in the spine off to the side, and that was the graft material right after I drilled. So I used the drill to decorticate the bone, basically remove the bone surface to promote fusion. And then I packed the stuff in the gutters on both sides, and that was actually a mixture of allograft and autograft together. So we did use um, autograft, but the graft material itself doesn't unpinch the nerves. It just promotes fusion. So remember we talked about the different stages of surgery. You have decompression, which is the laminectomy and foramenotomy, getting the pressure off the spinal cord and nerves. We have the realignment, which is putting the spine back into its natural alignment, which we did with the rod 
the way we contoured the rod to create lordosis after the patient's taken out of the pins. And then um, the stabilization is with the screws, rods, plus the fusion. So we use the autograph and allograph to stabilize with fusion. Do you have another question? That was the last question. I hope you enjoyed the surgery. This patient is going home today in about two hours when she wakes up. She'll have to get enough of the general anesthesia out of her body that she can um, safely go home. She'll be awake, alert, stable before we discharge her. So um, really it depends on the anesthesiologist and how he manages the patient in terms of how long it takes to get rid of the anesthesia. And every patient's different depending on their body type, body habitus, their liver function, and um, a lot of other factors. There's too many to list, but body temperature and pH and uh, blood flow, et cetera, all those things are important in elimination of anesthetic to wake a patient up. So hopefully you enjoyed the surgery. Next, we're going to be doing a Duke laser disc repair on a cervical spine for a herniated disc, C5-6.